Hi everyone, good afternoon and welcome for today's session. So did you go through the soft copy of the material? Did you read it? Emergence of sociology? Yes, few of you did it. Many of you went, went lazy, God knows why. You had some time in your hand. No worries, that's the reason because of which I have just kept three lectures in a week to begin with. And that's why I did not start with five lectures. I said that I'll take some time maybe 15, 20 lectures and then you'll be fit to go ahead with five lectures per day. So sorry, per week. So we'll go ahead with that. Good afternoon, Ayan, Amanpreet and all other regional centers, Shillong, Shimla, Lucknow, Muatupura. So um, that is Shimla. Rita Nagar logged in. Good afternoon. Okay, so um, when we are uh, going to start off with this first chapter today with a more formal insight, yesterday you got a formal narrative a background of what all was happening, how the changes were unfolding and how all the possibilities, uh, like yesterday I explained that Bhanu, the question that you are asking, watch words of modern state, please listen to that part again. This is the second time you are asking and I explained it after seeing your question, okay. So now when we are going to start with this component, I expected all of you to do, read everything and then come up with the insights. So you know, what I will do is I will explain this. And after explaining this, we'll take down the keywords, like how flowchart is prepared, how notes is prepared. Um, I believe all of you have prepared notes in standard 10th and 12th for different subjects, right? I mean, it's not possible that you are directly reading only from books. You must be having some handouts, right? Some key points. It is possible to do that in sociology also. In the end of the day, the language and the explanation, the details and the grammar comes from your own insight. It comes from your own I would say wholesome understanding and um, grabbing of the entire concept. That's how it works out. But when we are speaking about uh, uh, the, the linguistic explanation and expansion, that's something which all of you will be developing over the time period. Presently, when we are talking about uh, um, the development of content, you will like need some keywords, some key explanations in your answer on the basis of which the answer would be written. So yesterday I explained you very briefly a background related to modernity. I explained you what were the social changes in Europe and I explained you how in that background sociology was emerging as a response to hope and despair. The despair were the social problems that were caused due to modernity and hope was the hope for finding solutions by a scientific discipline which was studying the society systematically. So. Basically, we can see that sociology, which became a response to the hope and despair, um, it starts establishing itself. And I discussed that there were three phases in which we can see sociology evolve itself. The first phase, which is in the, we can say, 19th century, whereby it is in its nascent stage and it is trying to prove its worthiness, it's trying to establish itself. It is the 20th century when it gains an academic ground. It starts emerging as an independent discipline in various universities. By the end of 20th century, meaningful discourse and different other, we can say, perspectives, ideologies, thought processes evolved and got associated with it. And by the 21st century, now we consider that sociology has matured as a discipline. So we'll be like exploring all those possibilities. All right, so um, I've not been added to the group. Okay, yes, all those students who have yet not been, because this is something like Itanagar Center, I can see your concern. So um, not just Itanagar Center, some like one student from Bhuneshwar, one from Kolkata. Um, so different students who have yet not been added, like majority have been added, thankfully, by yesterday. But still, if anyone yet has been not added, Please reach out to Maram sir because I have given all your numbers and whatsoever has been provided by the management but still a uh, few students who don't have telegram or who don't have um, um, like uh, the app uh, per se then what has happened is we have sent them through SMS okay. 
So you can check your SMS. You will find that uh, Maram sir has reached out to you. If you have provided the management another number, but you are using another number, this is also happening with few of them, them that they have another number functional for uh, Telegram or WhatsApp and they have yet another number for like regular calling. So they have given the non-functional number, acting too smart. And the truth is now we are stuck that how to reach out to the student. So thing is, if anyone has done that, please reach out to him and inform the number which on which you are using social media. That was the purpose of taking the number and no other uh, like implicit purpose was there. So you can you can be added to that telegram group, that closed group and you can uh, start using it. There is no WhatsApp group. No one should be under the mirage that there is a WhatsApp group. I used to have WhatsApp group till uh, like you know March, means the last batch. But what I realized is that when a student joins in late, maybe a week late or 10 days late, then the student is suddenly lost. It's like, I need all the information from where it started. And I have watched the lecture from like or, or some previous session, which I'm quoting that in that session, I had shared this material and the child is like, nah, I don't have the access. So again, the entire material had to be posted in the group. So WhatsApp became a little redundant for the purpose. In Telegram, you can always, even if you're joining in late, you can check from the beginning what messages have been posted. So you can have access to it. Um, yesterday, I have posted Harlumbus and Holborn and I have posted uh, uh, Ridza for all those students who want to have direct access to an academic material to read. Chapter 1 of Ridza, I had highlighted. Please read it if you want some academic insight. Chapter 1 and Chapter 6 is going to fix this specific chapter of Ridza. So you can read Ridza if you want to read something academic. Other than that, like on this weekend, I'll be posting some lectures of senior academicians. So that even when my lecture is not going on, you're listening to someone else. Okay. So a parallel wholesome understanding keeps getting uh, uh, understood. Okay. So Lippi, you have been uh, like added Lippi. I've seen you responding also in the group. So like, I think that you have been added. All right. So um, just keep doing all that and that will be helpful. So um, when we are discussing about this specific dimension of modernity, social change in Europe and emergence of sociology and as we are going to start with it, oh, I had to give Maram's number. No? Okay. So he will be checking your basic details and then he will be like uh, helping you out. So it's 8373982300. He will be your one-stop solution to communicate related to any administrative hiccups that you feel or any kind of volume udhar se Okay. Done. So, is The problem is from there, not this. Is that right? Okay, I'll okay. slip this from the top. Technical glitch के है, इससे नहीं हो रहा, आपके इधर कहीं हो रहा है। हम्म, जा तो उसको बंद कर दीजिए। बच्चे ऐसे भी सुन लेंगे, आवाज नहीं रही थी। Is it audible? Right now? And the noise, the background noise also won't be there because it's a small class, so I think we can handle. ठीक है? Perfect. Okay. There's some problem with this. Okay. Now, so uh, when we are uh, discussing about this specific issue um, with respect to modernity, so shall we start with the chapter now? 
So when we are discussing about this specific issue related to modernity, yesterday we discussed about how sociology emerged in Europe. So when like any one of you was going through the material, a basic understanding was uh, like witnessed that sociology, I mean, if we talk about the idea of society and how society is unfolding itself, it's written, the thought is as old as society itself. Because the concerns of society, the problems of society have been thought by other thinkers as well. Like if we talk about Abdul Ibn bin Khaldun, okay, he had thought about it in Middle East, Turkey and all. Okay, you can see the thinkers not only from India, like if we speak of India, we had Chanakya writing Artha Shastra and talking about the idea of statesmanship, how to like uh, go ahead with governance and issues of administration, right? So it was about governing the society, looking into the concerns of the society. So we can see, if we see, like if we are talking about Europe, we can think of uh, Plato and Aristotle, we can think of Socrates, right? Over the time period, we can see that since ancient and medieval times, there have been a lot of thinkers, a lot of, we can say, um, um, social leaders who have tried to find out what the society is experiencing, why it is experiencing, and trying to provide solutions to those problems, isn't it? That's a continuous phenomena when we speak of it. So the moment it is written, social thought is as old as society itself, that's very true. But why are they not incorporated in the domain of sociology? Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, or for that matter, Cotillia, or like, you know, Ibn bin Khaldun. Why? What is the logic? The logic is they were not studying society scientifically systematically. Are you understanding that? So, when you are using scientific, systematic, empirical methods to observe what is happening in the society, to analyze what is happening in the society, to verify what you are arriving at as a conclusion, as a theory, whether it is valid or not, whether it is correct or not, when you are constantly verifying, cross-checking, like you know, approving and then you are arriving at a thesis, then it will be sociological in nature. So the initial day thinkers, they tried to use the methods of natural science in studying society, in studying social science. Okay. So when we speak of sociology, the science of society, the systematic study of society, so the science of society or the systematic study of society whereby you are verifying, you are validating, you are proving, you are testing, you are like, you know, ascertaining the hypothesis, you are establishing it as a, as a thesis, as a theory later, okay. So all that is happening only when you are making veritable efforts towards that direction following the methods and procedures, whereas the ancient thinkers when we speak of them, they were not using these methods and techniques. They were not always going by scientific methods and techniques to study about society or to have opinions, to have insights about society. That's why even though social thought or reflection about society existed since the very beginning, that is not referred to as sociology. If you would have been reading Ritzer, you would have found a similar thought but with a more academic and complex language, right? Okay. So when we are talking about it, you all can see that it is as old as society itself, yet the origin of sociology is traced back to 19th century Western Europe, specific also, Western Europe, okay? Then it is said that it is called as the child of age of revolution. Why? Because multiple revolutions were happening. What kind of revolutions were happening? So I spoke intellectual revolution, political revolution, economic revolution, remember all that? That's why sociology is a child of revolution. Why child of revolution? Because it is a byproduct of the changes, the conflicts, the confusions that the society was experiencing and trying to find an answer to those problems. When the society was observing those problems and trying to find an answer what we are experiencing, why we are experiencing, okay, then in that situation, what happened? We all could see that in that situation, the, uh, the, the discipline of sociology, it emerged because people realized we need a distinct discipline to study what is happening in the society, why it's happening in the society and how to go ahead with its analysis. All right. 
Okay, Sri Rama uh, Garnayak, I think that the sound problem which you experienced briefly or the background disturbance which Kochi Center was experiencing, now that is resolved. We just worked on that. Okay, so I hope that is like resolved. Everyone is finding a smooth like audibility, right? Okay, now please do inform, do assert this fact. Now, because people raise the concern and if I do not get a response, I am in myself subconsciously in a dilemma whether they are experiencing a resolution to the problem or not. All right. So, when we are discussing about it, we are just seeing that because sociology is treated as a child of revolution or changes, it in the in the we can see what are these changes? They are preceding three centuries. Why preceding three centuries? So, when we speak of 19th century, three centuries before, what will it be? 18th and before that 17th, before that 16th. So, the after the period of renaissance, the period of enlightenment comes into existence. So, intellectual revolution which starts from like we can say we can start tracing it after 15th century that is 16th onwards. So, that is again like a type of revolution and intellectual revolution. When we speak of industrial revolution, we can see late 17th century, 18th century industrial revolution unfolding itself. When we speak of French revolution, though the French revolution happens in the 18th century to be specific 1789, but does not it happen when we are speaking about the French revolution, okay, 1789, does not the conditions, the political conditions whereby people are angry, they are simmering with a lot of hatred and anger towards the monarchy. That condition of revolution started getting prepared, the background of revolution started getting prepared from the, we can say, the early 18th century itself. When I was talking about Louis 14, Louis 15, there was a lot of anger amongst the people. When it was Louis 16, he said, after me deluge shall come and actually deluge came. Like towards the end, we see that he is decapitated, right? He is, his head is hacked off. So, he is decapitated, his wife like Mary Antoinette later, her head was decapitated. But the thing is like what is all this uh, like uh, unfolding? So, all this unfolding that we all can see is nothing but different types of revolutions, whether they were simmering or those protests were going on or the background was going on that kept happening for three preceding decades, right? Okay. So, then it is saying that sociology took birth in such a climate of social upheaval. Now, you can understand what is the word social upheaval associated with, right? What is the term social upheaval? Social upheaval means the society is undergoing a lot of change. And what are these changes? What are these upheavals? Economic change due to industrial revolution, okay? Political change due to the different types of political revolts and which like summarizes as a huge revolution. First, French revolution, then impacting the political revolutions of other parts of the Europe. Do you remember Mussolini, right? Garibaldi, all these people, they are getting inspired by the French Revolution. Mussolini, in his speech, he is quoting French Revolution, okay, and constantly quoting the speeches made by the leaders of French Revolution. So, all that possibility. So, a lot of social upheaval is going on. And in the upheaval, people are looking for answers how to find a society which is relatively calm. A society which gains its balance, composure, a society which can have order and equilibrium. So, sociology emerges as an answer to those social problems. Okay? Yes, we have been connected with the Italy unification. So, all that is political background. Sociology as a discipline is a response to those problems. Okay? So, I will be making some flow chart for all of you to ease the concepts. You will keep noting it down. Okay? So, when we are speaking about it, so, you can just um, take up the insights. So, you can just keep noting down in the flow chart, keep making flow chart and keep adding it to the material, the soft copy which has been provided. So, first and foremost, you will be talking about what? So, you will be talking about soci sociology, how it is emerging in Europe, emerging first. Remember this fact first in Europe, yesterday one of the students said, ma'am, why are you discussing about Europe? So, you remember that I smiled, I showed the syllabus because sociology is emerging in Europe. Okay? So, first it is emerging in Europe, then you can further say that it emerges or it emerges and can be 
studied can be studied as a response to as a response to social intellectual and political changes in 18th to 19th century okay then further you can understand that there were dominant ideas dominant ideas of the then society what is the then society means the society which existed then the then society was rooted in was rooted in social contexts the social contexts of the given society first and foremost when we are speaking about the change like social intellectual and political so i will be first and foremost taking up intellectual when we speak of the intellectual changes okay so the intellectual aspect can be connected with the period of enlightenment right and when we speak of the period of enlightenment okay this is something which ripens and starts influencing the emergence of the ideas which facilitated the emergence of sociology that is 18th century okay when we are speaking of it when we speak of like let us say the political i'll choose another color so when we speak of the political so here we hint to what french revolution and when we like hint towards social okay the social possibility with economic economic slash social social because there were a lot of social problems associated with exploitation of the labor different types of crimes okay the so social slash economic both were laced together so they were a by product of the industrial revolution to begin with so i have given all this in your notes also but when you write you start integrating with the concept so you can just do it in the initial go i'm doing it in the class in the initial go so that you learn how to prepare notes this will not be done frequently for other topics there i will keep checking whether you are making notes or not by asking all of you to show your notes once in a while i'll reach out to all of you personally once in a while okay so there is a radical change in what there is a radical change in the thinking of feudal europe because at that time we can see that feudalism was existing when we speak of this radical change in feudal europe so what was the change there comes the spirit of questioning people start questioning everything they don't believe everything only on the face value they are like constantly saying that why should we believe something and why something should be followed if you remember um i said yesterday when i was quoting august comte that he said that initially man was god fearing nature fearing and that society which was associated with god fearing nature fearing that was a theosophical society then people started questioning and reasoning what should be there what ought to be there and that led to the emergence of metaphysical society remember all that and when the shift moved from god to society or community and from society and community to man then what happened as man came in the focus it became a positivist society so from theosophical to metaphysical from metaphysical to positivist society and in positivist society what will happen scientific temperament spirit of questioning always believing things on the basis of logic okay so this spirit of questioning will make you what it will make you scientific it will make you rational these words should simultaneously keep popping in your head okay so scientific rational it will keep making you feel a, like a, a question whatever is going on you are not believing things on face value whereas in feudal society what will happen there will be traditional thinking and in traditional thinking what will happen will you question will you question no you will not have a questioning mind you will always like uh, uh, just fo focus on the idea of believing on beliefs on traditions 
okay on customs there is no questioning whereas in a modern society when there is a radical change and when we speak of modernity so with modernity as radical changes unfold okay so with this specific dimension of modernity as radical changes unfold the spirit spirit of questioning shall come into existence okay learn the keywords become so very easy that while writing it or speaking it you don't have to think it effortlessly flows out of you okay okay let me share one more thing to all of you all the students who are present that the chapter 1 2 and 3 are the most scoring areas majority of the teachers they prefer to start with thinkers okay so um when we are speaking about this specific dimension kochi center you have not uh, like uh, reached out yet uh, you have yet not reached out with the disturbance i think the disturbance is done all good okay fine so um, when we are discussing about this and and yes itanagar center when you are asking about whatsapp group there is no whatsapp group this year there is only telegram channel and please check your uh, the number you have provided the official number you have provided please check the sms in sms you must have been provided the details of the link of the telegram channel okay and don't worry within a day or two every one will like get settled settled with the pace of what's going on how to enroll to the lecture how to have access to the material so just relax okay so with respect to this spirit of questioning and scientific temperament rational values i'll constantly encourage all of you that keep noting down the key points in future also when the notes like when you see the notes and start memorizing i'll show you some model answers also of the students who are selected so that you keep getting inspired okay so spirit of questioning scientific rational that's something which all of you can connect with then you can further talk about like development of science and commerce both will happen science which will boost technology okay so science will also give rational thinking okay so development of science and commerce this is something which will boost the component of radical change okay with this commerce what will happen the next component will happen that is commercial revolution will take place or commercial revolution will unfold so commercial revolution commercial revolution this commercial revolution is coming with what scientific revolution right scientific revolution why scientific revolution is incorporated because there is industrialization unfolding industrialization because there is like if we speak of it it is associated with mechanization mechanization means new machines tools usage of them right so this commercial revolution will again lead to new outlook to life when we speak of the new outlook this new outlook will make people question further so on one hand this commercial revolution which is getting a boost from scientific revolution and the science is giving people a rational thought process the science is giving the people a spirit of questioning what will happen with the new outlook will they not start questioning the political scenario the social scenario right so because of this new outlook the outcome the by product will be the french revolution the by product will be in economic sense we can see the industrial revolution so new outlook is the thought process this new thought process can be associated with the period of enlightenment as well so the thought is boosting the politics and the economy of the day okay the french industrial revolution in simplified language okay and both are or rather all the three are giving boost to sociology as a discipline when we are speaking of it then you can con con connect and contrast this with old europe or the traditional europe with the new europe okay so traditional europe with the new europe what is the traditional europe now you can speak of it these are some basic facts which you can play by your own self so what is the old or the traditional europe was it feudal yeah was it feudal oh, okay and what was the new europe is this industrial yes okay good you can start thinking from the economic perspective to begin with think about more possibilities so if this is traditional then what is this this will be modern 
if I'm saying this is feudal and this is industrial, and I'm saying that old Europe is traditional, so this will be modern, right? Okay. What more possibilities can be? Can you think? So here, when it is feudal, then it is land-centric economy, land-centric economy, right? Whereas over here, what kind of economy will be there? Machine-centric, production-centric, profit-making. Because when there is land-centric economy in the feudal society, you will see that there is a limitation to production, limitation to hoarding. Okay, surplus will be low over here. Whereas when we are speaking of industrial society, surplus can be very high. Profiteering can be a way of life. So surplus is high. Profit making is high. Okay. So because of which, what will happen? A new lifestyle can emerge, right? And when surplus is high, profit is high, then someone will exploit the other for making more profit. So human exploitation, crimes, social problems will emerge. Um, Heil Bronner, one of the thinkers, he was an economist at that time. He said that the entire production that was taking place in the region of Britain, okay, in the feudal times, could have been loaded up in one goods wagon. You understand a goods wagon of a train, malgadi, okay. So in a goods wagon, just one wagon full of grains, you put it, and that is it that was being produced. So you can very well understand that the nature of prosperity, what it would have been, the surplus would have been too low, profiteering would not have been much. But with industrialization, what will happen? You can increase the surplus, you can increase the production. And for, for increasing production and for increasing surplus, what will you do? You will exploit the labor, you will make the labor work harder. So 15 hours, 16 hours in a day, what will be the byproduct of a labor working for 15 or 16 hours, yes. If a labor is working for 15 or 16 hours, what will happen? Will the person's like life not be relegated to that of an animal condition? The person will be living in an animal condition because of that, yeah. And because of that, what will happen? Human rights will be violated. So human rights of women, children, labor in general will get violated. If someone is living in 15 for 15, 16 hours and getting barely hand to mouth salary or wages, in that situation, what will happen? A person will be living in filth. So we'll be living in the rundown areas like slums and all. Because of which, what will happen? Unhygienic living conditions, overworked bodies, underslept bodies. So immu the immunity will be low. The vulnerability to different diseases will be high. Child labor is rampant, right? A lot of women who are pregnant or lactating, they are also working. So that will also further break down their immunity. So maternal mortality rate will be high. Child mortality rate will be high. Means women who are mothers or potential mothers, they can die. Children can die at an early age because of the mothers not being, ag being able to feed the child. Multiple types of diseases due to unhygienic, filthy environment can spread. Mental disorders can occur. Crime rate can increase because of poverty. That's why. Towards the beginning of 20th century, various sociologists and economists, they said that absolute poverty is a man-made phenomena. So this study of society led to the realization that the problems that we are witnessing, it is not because of nature. You must be remembering Gandhi. He said that nature is providing enough for everyone's need, but not to suffice everyone's greed. Remember that? Gandhi had said that. Yes, in the feudal society also a lot of problems were there, but the problems were not so magnified as they were magnified in the industrial society. That's why when you see Karl Marx, Karl Marx is saying that industrial society is a new form of slavery because the way a slave did not have control over mind and body and the duration of labor, in the similar manner, in an industrial society, the labor is reduced to a slave. At least in slave society, if a person was like, let's say, like netting and was knitting some rope or cooking something, there was still some creative satisfaction involved in the work. 
Marx said that capitalist society is even worse than slavery because work is done majority of the times by the machines and people are they are just trying to regulate they are just trying to uh, like let's say function as per the ease of their existence right i mean the the capitalists and for the their own ease of existence and for multiplying of their profit they are exploiting the labor class the labor class when it is like let us say operating the machines it has limitation to what all work it can do in the sense there is no creativity suppose the person has to just put caps on the bottles so the entire day the person is doing this 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 there is no creativity so when the person is sleeping in the sleep also the person is doing this 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 why right? the brain and the body has become immune so for one day two days 10 days 20 days the person can do after a month the person will start getting disillusioned with the work will not enjoy the work so he'll be just doing it mechanically but the person is not having enough time to spend with spend with family friends neighbors etc so the person will start like you know detaching from the entire process of work so first from the product at least in a like feudal society if there is an artisan not getting the right value for like let's say one's basket or a bag that the person has woven but the person can see i made this bag or i made this shoe or i made this like let's say basket so there is a creative satisfaction human beings we don't work only for making our ends meet we don't work only to fill in our pockets with some money we don't work only to get a salary we also work or i would say rather the prime reason to work is creative satisfaction people who don't get creative satisfaction in their work they suffer from monday blues they'll say oh my god monday is coming oh i mean like if you are really enjoying your work like let's say as a photographer painter musician do they have a sunday monday no they can create any time they can enjoy any time they can contribute any time i mean we as teachers once in a while when the schedule is on sunday we don't say ah oh, sunday also no it's okay doesn't matter which day it's a holiday which day we are working till the time we are enjoying and celebrating the process of learning okay so when work becomes exploitative when it becomes mechanical and when it becomes like for prolonged duration then human being is relegated to an animal status earlier the slave was like made to do a lot of work which animals were supposed to do right later on the slaves started getting replaced by animal people started controlling animals and training animals and bit by bit we started moving away from slavery as well anyway that all will be discussed in historical materialism when i'll be discussing karl marx so marx was the person who contested and he questioned that capitalism is so very problematic and it is something which is relegating the status of a human being from experiencing and being humane in condition the humane conditions are snatched away that's not fair for an individual to live like that to experience like that right and when karl marx was protesting that is how we see that marxism slowly and steadily starts raising its head in marx's own lifetime marxism went ahead of him so in the berlin conference probably it was 1969 he actually made this public statement that i am not a marxist i don't know who is okay because the ism or the ideology moved ahead of him even during his own lifetime that's why you'll realize a lot of if you read marx very thoroughly you'll realize that he is speaking a lot of other things which are like slightly different from more philosophical more wholesome more benevolent benevolent would be a right word more benevolent than than what marxist ideology is about okay so anyway when we are speaking of it, it marx said that we need to find a solution to human crisis and that is how he had his own way to provide a solution which was the gori way the blood bath which is not endorsed and he sponsored also a lot of rebellions and revolts to the extent that even though he lost his own child his only child because he could not provide enough medicines he was thrown away from his house because he could not pay the rent despite of all of that when his first big this book that is communist manifesto when it became the first it was not technically the first book it was the first big hit okay so when he made money from that he purchased guns and pistols and he provided that to all the labor union guys 
that just go for a blood revolution. Your rights, it has to be snatched. You deserve to live a good life. Why should someone else snatch your rights? Anyway, we will discuss all that when we are talking about Marx. So when we speak of this specific possibility that was there no exploitation in feudalism? Yes, the feudal lords or the masters were exploiting the, the feudal lords, they were exploiting the serfs or the, we can say the peasants. So the lords were exploiting the serfs or the peasant class for their labor. Sometimes they were exploited to provide the surplus production whereby the final ownership of land was with the feudal lords. The serfs were only having the right to cultivate and the right to cultivate was passing from one generation to another generation. It was not the ownership of land, only the right to cultivate. So somewhere the condition was slightly better than that of a slave. The person had the freedom to sleep and eat whatever and whenever the person wanted, but there was a lot of hard work, a lot of strenuous work to be done in the fields. In the initial stage, the feudal lords didn't have even a standing army. So half the times the peasants were fighting with limited information and knowledge about weaponry and like, you know, how to go ahead for a fight. And later on, the feudal lords, they created a separate standing army, which yesterday I was hinting that they were provided with salt as salary. Remember that? The word salary coming from salt, I hinted. So we see that it got parted. Peasants, they were meant for cultivation, but if there was a war, if there was a climatic condition, which was a crisis ridden uh, like condition, like a flood, like a drought, these peasants were further exploited that whatever savings you have or whatever extra, like, you know, things that you have saved, you need to contribute for saving the society. They were also sometimes pressurized to work for free for the feudal lord if there is a crisis ridden situation. So sometimes through gifting, sometimes through labor, they were made to exert extra. So yes, even in the feudal society, there was exploitation. But still, there was some scope and space for creativity. There was some scope and space for uh, connecting with what you are doing. That was even further relegated in the industrial society. And it was very exploitative in terms of the working condition, in terms of, of the environment, the place where people were living. Okay. So I hope all of you are understanding that. Uh, Ma'am, is there a clear line between old and new Europe? No, there will be a phase when there will be a transition happen. Okay. But when we are distinguishing it clearly and identifying what is old, what is new, in that situation, we will have to identify, we will have to understand that on what basis the characteristics can be, like, you know, distinguishedly be identified. Okay. I hope everything sounds simplified. There's a lot of logic to every single word. If you'll ask, I'll end up giving a lot of sociological information. I'll keep going simple till the time I'm writing and using basic words. Okay. Um, uh, then what is why people feel alienation from work? Alienation from work for the simple reason work was too mechanical. We'll be talking about alienation. The whole concept of alienation is there in your syllabus when we speak of Karl Marx. You get 10 marker, short note, questions related to it. So there are four stages and then how a person gets dissociated from product, then process, then the family and the neighborhood and then himself or herself. Okay. So all that will be discussed. But little later when we are taking up that chapter. Okay. So uh, old was theocratic, very good, and new was logical and based on positivism. Amazing, uh, Gwen. So that is, no, that's uh, Golvin. Okay, that's what, if I'm pronouncing correctly. What about development of art? I appreciate, like, you know, the, the realm with which you are thinking, okay, we can definitely consider that when we are speaking of the a world of art, though it's not about art, but if you are thinking about the world of art, definitely the societies will be influencing even the art, whereby the modern Europe will be talking about new lines and new structures in the name of art, and the old will be talking about its own cursive possibilities. Anyway, so when we are discussing about it, let us like continue with this. So how about religion? Will this society, the traditional society be religious? Yes. It will be religious. Why religious? Because religion will be supreme. Okay. So religious institution, let me write down. Religious institution will hold supreme position. So do you remember yesterday we were talking about first estate, second estate, third estate. 
in France, first estate was clergy. Remember? Yeah. So you can just remember France, like we discussed about it yesterday, France, clergy. They were the ones who were ruling. They were the ones who were influencing and controlling the politics also of the day. And I told you sometimes they were less religion and more less religious and more political. Remember that? That's what? Okay. Then further, when we are discussing about it, uh, influence of church on the state, so very true. Okay. And when we are speaking about these people, so what will happen? Yeah. Here, what will happen with respect to religion? Religion will also start getting questioned. Right. So Galileo, Galilee, and then he is punished. Remember? Yeah. Copernicus, so you can think of them. So religion starts getting questioned in the new Europe. This is the background that starts unfolding as all of you see. Again, you can see that uh, the society is divided on the basis of two classes. There is feudal lords, which I was discussing, and the peasants or the serfs. Peasants or S-U-R-F-S, okay, serfs. S-U-R-F or S-E-R-F, yes. S-E-R-F, very good. Like, uh, what did I do? Okay. So, this is what feudal lords and serfs. And here, what do we see? Yes. After this, feudal lords and serfs here. It's very easy. Capitalists and, and labor. Right? Okay. So, the labor is referred as proletariat. Later on, all those technical words also you will get uh, exposed to, but don't worry. To begin with, you can just go easy. Here, Classes are distinct and clearly defined. Classes distinct and clearly defined. Remember first estate, second estate, third estate. So first estate, religious leaders, clergy. Second estate, we can think of monarchy or feudal lords or we can connect it with the, we can say, uh, uh, when we are talking about the swords and the robes and people asking, ma'am, why to refer to them as swords? And no, when we are talking about the nobility with respect to swords and robes, then uh, why is it referred as swords and robes? And then I explained that robes is for judges and the people who are managing the administration. And when we say swords, they are associated with people who are fighting, uh, like uh, the, the we can say the feudal lords, or also we can think of viscounts. All these are getting incorporated. So classes are distinct and they are clearly defined in this specific dimension. Here we can see when we speak of class. So classes, they are overthrowing. Old classes overthrown in this new society. Old classes overthrown like monarchy, like feudal lords. You are overthrowing them, right? Feudal lords. And new classes will emerge, right? So new classes emerge. Okay, then further when we are discussing about it, family and kinship with respect to the old society, family and kinship, K-I-N-S-H-I-P, not kingship, kinship. Kinship means blood relations, relatives, okay? So we can think of family and kinship, they, they are central to an individual's life, central to an individual's life. Okay, and when we are discussing about like let's say the society over here, what is the status of like let's say family? So the family loyalties, the family loyalties are associated with we can say um, like uh, it starts shrinking. So here when it starts shrinking, we see it becomes associated with nuclear family, right? nuclear family. We can see there is rise of individualism. Is new European society a metaphysical society? No, it is a positivist society. Okay. So, individualism, sorry, individual, just a second. Individualism. All right. So family loyalties, they start shrinking. Nuclear families are existing. Along with nuclear families, we can see the individualism is like constantly rising. We can see that politically also we see that we shift from monarchy to democracy. Right. All that stuff starts happening. 
when we are talking about it the position of women that can be debated the position of women that undergoes a change right okay here we can see monarchy monarchy and feudal lords all right so i hope all of you are getting a brief background of what we are experiencing in europe everyone is understanding that right okay then when we are speaking of it how about giving you a brief background like let's say 14th to 18th century when we are speaking of it in terms of all the different types of changes which is like the commercial change the scientific change uh, like which is leading to industrialization when we are speaking about like let's say the renaissance period okay because we all can see all this is building the possibility so like let's say let me speak of the commercial change first so commercial revolution when we speak of the commercial revolution we can connect it with like let's say 1450 to 1800 here i discussed that at this time period europe was living with subsistence means of subsistence because feudalism is there right so subsistence economy subsistence subsistence economy and this is during the medieval europe because 1450 is there so like let's say medieval europe with this we can see that they start moving towards dynamic and worldwide system how dynamic and worldwide system who will give the logic how did it become dynamic and worldwide system yes how did it become dynamic and worldwide system because yes did trade and commerce increase bit by bit did traveling increase from 1450 to 1800 did the different companies they started traveling and voyageering voyage they went for different types of voyages remember from the silk route silk route marco polo remember so from marco polo who's finding the silk route marco polo the italian guy right so that's how italy got a control complete control and monopoly over the land route right so marco polo he finds the he discovers the silk route and with the help of the silk route prosperity reigns in italy they try to control the i, rest, I yesterday only talking about that they monopolized their control over silk and spices coming from oriental world remember this is back background just remember the background yesterday that's why i was saying that today you listen to it like a story but tomorrow you'll have to remember it like a chronological order more formally okay so this is what so it monopolized italy monopolized the silk and the spices coming from the oriental world right then after that what do we see so when we speak of dynamic and worldwide system so how will something become dynamic and worldwide so dynamic because there will be more connectivity how worldwide because global economies will start reaching out there are no more isolated pockets of existence they are constantly integrating right okay so when this is happening we all can see that on one hand marco polo is discovering the land route later on we see that a lot of sea routes were discovered by whom portuguese spanish french british right uh, we discussed yesterday only that with respect to india goa portuguese french puducherry uh, when we speak of kolkata then it is british right all these three quarters so you can think of it okay and that's how this becomes a dynamic and a worldwide system whenever you see a word try to find the history of the word try to understand the wholesomeness of the word then they won't be just mere words that you have to cram you remember the word because you know the logic it applies to gs as well majority of this time students tend to forget the key words while explaining the answer when they don't remember the meaning of that key word when they don't remember the details of the key word okay so yes Gene geneva and vienna traders monopolized the oriental trade okay discovery of the sea route for america africa led to increase in trade and commerce good all of you are able to now connect it with your component of gs i really appreciate that okay then i don't know about the feudal lords 
okay uh, sri rama it's like feudal lords are basically having huge chunks of land they are controlling large pastries of land okay and that's why they are called feudal lords they themselves are not like uh, cultivating they are encouraging the serfs to cultivate for them okay now moving ahead further so everyone is understanding this bit right so there happens expansion of trade and commerce because of that so expansion of trade and commerce along with this what will happen and because this expansion okay why do we call it a revolution industrial revolution commercial revolution why because this expansion when it becomes large scale okay when this becomes large scale it becomes a revolution similarly industrial revolution why industrial revolution when one or two industries are opening it's not industrial revolution but when industries open rampantly in all parts of europe big and small everywhere transforming the regional economy transforming the regional politics then it becomes revolution getting it so we cannot casually use the word revolution when we'll be talking about another chapter later later after two months or so like political system you'll realize that in sociology or in general also you should not casually replace words like revolt movement revolution agitation every single word has its own distinct meaning protest revolt revolution all this has different meanings so when there is a large scale rapid wholesome transformation of the society we call it revolution okay so when the expansion of trade and com commerce it started happening worldwide it started influencing at a worldwide level then it is called a revolution commercial revolution okay now so very good indu when you can think of it that it's a big change and it is a large scale change okay so when all of you are understanding this bit let us then further and i hope all of you are noting down keywords even the online students and the students from satellite centers sit with pen and paper on a table and chair do not fool around by lying down because the only challenge of someone who's not sitting in the class is the onus of responsibility to be accountable towards studies falls on the shoulder of the student here everyone keeps watching me and looking at me and noting down the keywords i cannot control what's happening behind my back someone who's online or someone who's like in satellite center how do i know that whether a student is sitting and listening to me or just lying down is like la la today i'll just lie down have a, like take bites of carrot and just enjoy the lecture i cannot control it okay so anyone who is watching it in an online mode do not waste your time that are phir se sun lenge no don't waste your time your time is too precious listen to it only once but listen to it in a concrete manner all right so uh, people who tend to listen to things on loop are either slow learners which you should not be if you are preparing for civil services or they are lazy as simple as that mentally intellectually lazy they don't want to exert extra because if you are alert you can just absorb everything in one go is not something very technical or tough also it's just like simmering okay now further so you can just talk about all the initiatives that were taken up so initiatives just in brief initiatives by which i have been constantly saying portugal so portugal spain okay we can speak of england you can speak of speak of holland because at that time holland was existing england okay and because of which what happened we can see that uh, these initiatives also encouraged to increase the economic power and political power so they constantly work towards increasing their economic and political power okay. so earlier we can see they were having a trade with india so earlier trade with respect to india and china because it was based on land route as i told you it the italian monopoly okay um later on we see that it shifts shifts to sea route and when we speak of sea route you can think of vasco da gama so marco polo to vasco da gama vasco da gama right when did he come in india from portugal it was probably 1498 right okay so you can just speak of 
इट इंडिया फोर्टीन नाइनटी एट ओके सो वास्को डगामा इज अ पोर्चुगीज गाय वेन यू गो टू गोवा डोंट जस्ट गो टू सी हाउ दीज पीपल आर कंडक्टिंग दो वॉट इज इट कॉल्ड या पीपल दो गो फॉर या या द सनबर्न पार्टी एंड ऑल दैट इज फन फाइन यू गो एंड लिसन टू द म्यूजिक एंड चिल I'm speaking about gambling. People go for gambling on those ships, right? That those which are parked in the sea, certain nautical miles distant. What are they called? I just forgot. The roulette and all that stuff is played. Yeah. So you understand what I imply to say. Don't just go to check it out. Across the road from where you enter to go to check out how gambling is taking place. Okay. Uh, just across the road there is museum, the Goan Museum. Go to the Goan Museum. visit the goa's museum and then see how the portuguese had entered india how they slowly and steadily started taking control and command of the local administration how they influenced the language and the people and the culture and the customs the religion everything it went underwent a lot of sea change so just read about that okay other than that we you can think of america okay so america when we speak of it so uh, like when we speak of discovery of the accidental discovery of america this is beneficiary to spain beneficiary beneficial to like if i speak of america south america south america beneficial to spain if i speak of north america that was beneficial to uh, we can speak speak of uh, like britain we can think of uh, like france we can think of but primarily britain because they were the smart people in terms of exploiting not a single country or part of the world they left when it came to exploitation that's why it was said that the british flag never uh, like you know experiences a sunset so okay so when we are speaking of that north america it, you can speak of britain primarily french were also involved it's not like they were not there so gradually what we can see is gradually you can see that spain and the control of portugal it declines these are some basic facts which you should be aware and if you are not aware of european history and the importance of britain i'm writing brain why so britain okay so importance of britain france and when we are speaking of it in terms of um, uh, britain france and uh, that one the third one uh, that is uh, associated with which one holland yeah so holland their importance it started increasing okay another change in terms of commercial revolution when we are speaking of it there is expansion of banking when we speak of expansion of banking we all can see that there is again a lot of change like credit facilities improved right along with the credit facilities we all can see that we can also see that now the check gets introduced 18th century we see the checks are getting introduced we can see that paper money gets introduced at this time period paper money so salt first gets replaced by coinage coinage gets replaced by paper by 18th century we can see there is growth of companies that takes place growth of companies so you're just understanding the background the economic background which is leading to all types of changes this is leading to regulated uh companies so regulated companies basically we can think of 16th century and all by 17th century there is joint stock companies and should I, should i mention that okay i think so so 16th century then we have the joint stock companies right joint stock companies because this will act as a background for you to understand other aspects and then we have the chartered companies the chartered companies that is for example the british companies okay so that is something which we can connect it with like 18th century or so right so this is like 18th century like east india company britain i'm just writing eic i hope you can elaborate upon it okay so this is what the we can see the dutch company also the dutch company was also a chartered company so you can think of that another change when we think of europe is associated in terms of the commercial change we can think of like let's say the rise of middle class the rise of 
middle class. This is yet another very important point. Middle class is also in your syllabus in paper 2. The background of how economic change gives a boost to the middle class, the basic understanding can get established in this very first chapter itself. So, when we speak of the rise of middle class, you can think of like the economical, the economic powerfulness that the middle class gains, it becomes economically very powerful by the end of uh, 17th century. Why? Because you need managers to manage the industries, right? You need managers to take care of the different types of companies, right? So, the managerial class will rise, which is working on the basis of intellect, a system whose current state generates its successive state by rule of principle of change, the so-called evolution rule, and thus produces a trajectory in a state space. Yes, definitely. You can consider when you are speaking about it. Um, okay, so where was I? Where was I? Yeah. So I was discussing what the middle class. So middle class, it it just rises as a byproduct of this industrial revolution, which starts unfolding bit by bit. By 17th century, we see that it starts gaining eminence. Okay, economically, it starts gaining a lot of power. Okay, in Western Europe, especially. So I'll just write it down. Western Europe, and we see that this middle class it becomes politically powerful by 19th century. Politically powerful. You should remember this, that it becomes politically powerful by 19th century, sorry, by 19th century, all right. So, all of you can probably connect with this very dimension. Now, because of this trade and commerce and commercial revolution, what will happen? Because of that, we will see the Europeanization of the world will occur, Europeanization of the world. You know, presently Americanization of the world is happening, isn't it? That is a soft power, a way to impact your psyche, your language, your the thought process, right? A lot of people who speak American accent in India after watching the sitcoms and after watching the movies, have you seen that? That is so very distinct. It is different from this Indian accent. In Indian accent also, we can have thick regional accents like a Bengali or an Assamese when speaking English can mix the Bengali tone or the Assamese tone or uh, like let us say a Tamilian can mix the Tamilian tone. Uh, like let us say a person who is Malayali can mix a Malayali tone, right? A Gujarati can mix a Gujarati tone. So, we have a tendency to mix it. I try to free it as much as possible from my like mother tongue, but still we all have a distinct impact of it, isn't it? But when it comes to the American accent, choice of American words, choice of American lingos, nowadays people even using those spellings, doing away with U or UE in different types of words like catalog, C A T A L O G, they are like it is G U E. When we speak of revolution or no, when we speak of zation, like a modernization, globalization, British English says it is S, but American English makes it Z. And you can see nowadays Z is accepted, it's like it is okay, we will not cut your spelling if you put Z, is not it? So, it is a very subtle impact. If a country starts impacting your food habit, burgers, if it starts impacting your thought process, your language, if it is coercing some other change through some public policy or coercing your governments to accept a policy, that will be more easily accepted than those policies given by a country or a culture which you are alien to, which you are not accustomed to. Understanding that? So, soft power, it works subtly on your psyche. Anyway, so the soft power of the present day is, we can say that it is experienced from the nascent level when commercial revolution started happening. And this commercial revolution started happening when Europeanization of the world started happening. You know, prior to that, if you see like uh, uh, the, the world of knowledge and the world of different types of, we can say, uh, systems of knowledge, then Oriental world was given a lot of regard, like China and India, they were given a lot of regard in the world of knowledge. But when the British came, they systematically, under the Macaulay Minutes plan, they systematically did away with prioritizing the oriental form of learning and they prioritize the western uh, like uh, we can say uh, perspective of learning. Why? Because they had to create clerks. 
so they did not want them to be thinking rationalizing human being they should be capable of understanding the language that is english they should be capable of calculating and doing some basic maths and they should be capable of hand handling files if they have too much of self assertion about their past their history their like you know sense of achievement sense of innovation then they will gain a sense of affirmity towards their own culture and tradition any civilization which takes pride in its culture and tradition cannot be controlled and governed for long and that's why systematically they try to hit upon the traditional forms of learning and wisdom which existed in different colonies across the world they try to assert their own patterns of learning okay it has its own repercussion in different parts of the world but europeanization of the world happened first commercially then also it will impact intellectually on the good side we got exposed to our think tanks our leaders they got exposed to we can say uh, ideas like um, we can say liberty equality and fraternity right so when our leaders they went to europe and they studied from there they came with the ideas of democracy liberty and fraternity india just imagine if in 1857 if we would have been liberated there was a fair chance that from delhi when i go when i travel to bhubaneswar or when i travel to kolkata i would have had to get passports issued are you getting it why because there were different princely states if we would have been liberated the idea of unity in diversity which existed culturally and socially in india traditionally but not politically politically on and off it was getting disintegrated the great chola empire okay it survived for more than thousands of years more than a thousand year okay in southern part of india but in north india students hardly know about it hardly study about it right the vijayanagar empire which was like you know existing even in the 17th century and then mr akshay kumar has the audacity of saying that the last great hindu king was prithviraj chauhan because he is making a movie on it it's like hello dude do some history just do some homework of history please know about the history of odisha kalinga okay and please know some history about like let's say vijayanagar you'll realize there have been leaders okay in different parts of india who were free from the mughal rule as well okay so you cannot generalize without knowing enough but that's a problem we are suffering from that post truth world whereby information is constantly manipulated and and impacted but anyway so europeanization of world when we are speaking of it this is the first phase whereby through the commercial revolution the world was slowly and steadily influenced politically and later even intellectually okay you'll see that it starts influencing the global order it starts influencing the political leadership it starts influencing the way people get we can say mobilized they start representing themselves they start protesting they start standing up for their rights okay understanding this bit okay so bhanu as you are asking that how the middle class becomes politically powerful because it starts negotiating politically i mean in india let us say for that matter in india who are the political leaders who prop who propagated the freedom movement and or who stood for the masses in the freedom movement majority of them who were they middle class men majority of them were middle class men isn't it so these middle gandhi he was a middle class person who somehow his parents could make the ends meet and send him somehow to study in europe he comes back he tries to practice in south africa presently also you'll be like oh my god that's a... he was not from a princely family or a richly state getting it just that it was a fa family of merchants and his father could somehow make the ends meet to send a boy there were a lot of struggles a lot of leaders who studied abroad or who could not make it uh, to study abroad who studied in india only but provided leadership for example if we speak of bhagat singh so bhagat singh a middle class boy who is studying and who is reading and he's before his death he was reading about socialism and when one of his jail inmates he said why are you studying now he said this is the only tool this is the only method of liberating so every youth should give his or her best energy to study as much as possible imagine a man who is to be hanged within an hour is still studying even before the death he is prioritizing study you are of the same age do you prioritize studies like this you could not even finish a handout 
which was shared with you in the group. Okay, and then you are like Bhagat Singh. Bhagat Singh and people like Bhagat Singh are constantly living in you. And the idea to liberate your country from impoverishment and exploitation is a constant challenge. The idea of liberty is too broad. It's not something whereby only when some foreign force is controlling. Within the country also there can be a lot of forces which can pull down the country. So what is your hustle? What is your effort? How you are working towards freeing your country? Getting it, all of you? Yeah. So it sounds, all of this sounds too fun. Only till the time it is the truth of someone else. The moment you have to live the truth yourself and you have to struggle and work towards it, it becomes little strenuous, isn't it? Start living it. You say you want to be a civil servant. Why? Ask the question. You can get better salary, a better lifestyle with so many other jobs in this country. Then why did you choose civil services? So somewhere the answer is, ma'am, I want to serve the society. I want to serve the needy. So the idea to serve should constantly be motivating you. That am I motivated towards my target today or not? Have I studied enough today or not? Okay. Now, so when we are discussing about this, so Europeanization of the world and connecting you with so many other realities simultaneously. Okay. So Europeanization of the world takes place and then strengthening of monarchy also started happening. Because if you remember, East India Company was, when it was uh, undergoing the revolt of 1857, then who took control of India? Who took control of India? Who colonized India? So after colonialism, imperialism happened, right? Right? All of you can connect with that. So after the control of East India Company, the power shifted from East India Company to whom? The British monarchy. Do you remember? So strengthening of monarchy also happened initially in this process. Okay. And though it is debatable also, if we, if we speak of it, because in different parts of the world, the already revolts had started. So on one hand, the strengthening of monarchy happened and later we can see political revolts, in certain cases even revolutions, okay, revolts, revolutions overthrew the monarchy, overthrew the monarchy. We will be talking about the political aspect a little later. Now, we can think about the intellectual revolution when we speak of it. So, like let us say scientific temperament. So, scientific, let me take a different color now. So, scientific revolution and renasa when we speak of it. When I was of your age and when I struggled with spellings, because if anyone struggles with spellings, try to remember the correct pronunciation, it's renasa. But when you have to remember the spelling, it's renaissance. That's how I used to like remember. Renaissance pronounced as renasa. Okay. So you can have your own methods to like memorize it. When you speak, when you pronounce correctly, it sounds good. Uh, you, you seem to be a well-read person nowadays in the world of YouTube, you can always check the correct pronunciation of any word, isn't it? And with good pronunciation, it, sh it shows that you are a well-read person, you are curious, you are constantly cross-checking, upgrading your skills, okay? So that's there. So scientific revolution and renasa, when we speak of it, so first and foremost, you can take down certain keywords related to this as well. So science, when we are speaking of it, so science will start influencing the society. And when starts influencing the society, then all of us can see that the attitude, the beliefs of the society will start altering, right? So in medieval period, what did we see? What was happening in the medieval period? Yes, there was control of, of what? Control of whom? Control of religion. There was control of feudal lords, right? This is what all of you are aware of so far. So... And they were quite powerful. Religion was too strong with its belief systems, controlling the thought process of the people. But with renasa and scientific temperament, when we speak of it, what happens? What comes because of renasa and scientific temperament? So due to renasa and scientific temperament, we all can find that there was a change in all aspects. If we are talking about visual art, it started depicting the human body and nature. So nature and human body started taking the center stage. I told you that as the societies change from God 
it was like community that came to the forefront from community then in the modern age who came to the forefront individual human being and that also was depicted in art okay so in the visual art you can see man is coming to the center stage here also there is a like a kind of bias but we'll be talking about it little later in medicine we can again further see there is like anatomy which is like physiology okay pathology all this is coming into existence in the world of medicine again we can see in the like the development of chemistry happens massively during this time period we can say there is a development of navigation there is development of uh, uh, what to say astronomy all this is taking place right remember copernicus i was discussing about him that dutch person so he gave the geocentric he said that from geocentric theory we need to believe in heliocentric theory means it is not earth around which sun is revolving it is the sun around which the earth is revolving right so all those you can think of uh, probably i'll just write in bracket copernicus copernicus and you can connect him with geocentric theory to to heliocentric theory helios is for sun okay so it is easier for you to remember so from like geocentric theory he is moving to heliocentric theory okay so initially we see that when this time period happens after this comes the post renasa period and post renasa renaissance as we write it okay so we see that galileo galilei comes into existence galileo we can see kepler kepler's theory you must be reading all this in science newton all these individuals this talk about uh, like you know the transformation they talk about observation and then believing in something so experimentation observation experiment observation I mean other types of i'm just in short i'm going to write down scientific methods because that's something we'll study in the next chapter so scientific methods okay we all can see that all these possibilities occur in post renasa because of which what do we see that a lot of changes start articulating whereby the human beings they start questioning finding logic anything which lacks logic people stop believing like christianity in christianity it was a geocentric theory that the earth is in the center the sun is revolving around it because of which you see that galileo galilei was punished right he was first he was ostracized and imprisoned and later on he died so when we speak of all those possibilities it was only because people were uh, like you know having that uh, hitch that if today one theory gets defeated of the bible tomorrow many such theories can get contested and if that keeps happening people will not believe in the religion and all the religious leaders who felt that the control and command over religion will slip out then they felt that they will become powerless so that led to retaliation because of which this person was targeted so all that started unfolding again in this post renasa period when we speak of biology we can think of charles darwin right so biology and evolution and when we speak of biology and evolution okay so biology and evolution we can think of darwin charles darwin right and darwin we can first and foremost think of william harvey because he is the one who is inspiring even uh, the uh, the the th thought process of herbert spencer so william harvey he gave the theory of the circulation of blood blood circulation in iga diya blood circulation the key words which should make these are the details i mean if ever even a specific area is asked 150 words answer related to like let's say the period of enlightenment you have enough content to write about a lot of them a lot of names a lot of insights okay so we can see charles darwin and he is giving the idea of origin of species remember survival of fittest which he borrowed from spencer many people think survival of fittest is given by darwin no it was given by herbert spencer 
first spencer spoke of survival of fittest darwin borrowed it from him and used it in his theory of evolution okay anyway so origin of species all of you can connect with that as well then when we are speaking of all of this and uh, like uh, there was a ch so origin of species this was opposed by the conservatives opposed by conservatives because everything which is in which is existing which is stable which is making a person hold power that person will suddenly feel powerless because their ideas and concepts will get contested and in such a situation they will try to maintain their authority how by letting the old order prevail remember yesterday also when we were discussing about french revolution and later the uproar i said that the conservatives wanted the old order the old stability they wanted the old system so conservatives are generally the powerful people who are at an advantageous position because of the traditional practice and they don't want to easily like you know uh, give up on their power so that's something which you can connect with so opposed by conservatives that's what you can think of and then we can after darwin we can see that uh, he was widely accepted further okay so widely accepted okay who is influencing darwin i said that was herbert spencer and herbert spencer yesterday yesterday i gave his organismic analogy remember that organismic analogy remember wo ganda sa keeda maine banaya tha there was a very badly drawn insect with different organs yeah so that's what so analogy when we speak that right analogy means comparison when you compare the organism with that of a society the way in a society we, there is an individual different types of individuals from different communities different ideas perspectives forming a community forming a society then a region then a state then a nation in the similar manner and then all of them despite having distinct qualities supporting each other coexisting with each other in the similar manner there are different institutions in the society the institutions are comprising of different rules regulations individuals and different levels of we can say stratification and every institution is distinct in its feature like religious institution is different from the educational institution from the institution of marriage the institution of family so every institution is following and fulfilling its own goals its own targets and every institution is like you know supporting the other right and thus and thus the entire society is being supported the entire society is coexisting the entire society is trying to like uh, help each other out so all the institutions inside the society is trying to help each other out now so all of you are understanding all this like possibility then comes the french revolution right so the french revolution when we speak of it french society remember what was the french society comprising of the french society was comprising of three estates remember i have given it in the like notes also three estates right that was how it was like stratified when we speak of the first estate who was the first estate yes so the first estate was associated with the religious leaders the higher clergy and not only the higher clergy also there was the lower clergy also to higher clergy i said they were the rich well off people they were the ones who were bishops archbishops right and there was the lower priest parish priests so lower parish priests and i am clubbing two words just a second so we can see that there are lower parish priests and the lower parish priests they were the poor guys struck in like poverty and the higher clergy were the ones who were actually minting the money they were having like a lot of power they were into constantly drinking gambling and controlling political power as well that's why uh, the downfall nothing else okay so th sometimes it was said very popularly that they are all but not religious okay so that's also there then how about the second estate do you remember the second estate yes what was the second estate second of second estate was comprising of two dimensions nobles of swords who are nobles of swords quick recall quick revision okay fine landlords can be there and monarchs be there yes 
Who else can be there? Yes. They are considered as the parasite class. Who else can be there? The wasted class, the parasite class. Okay. Who else can be there? Sometimes Y counts. Okay. Modern day zamindars can also be like, you know, they can be compared to zamindars. Compared to zamindars. So that you can just remember. I just want all of you to remember. Okay. Compared to zamindars of India. Okay. So they were like, you know, in principle, they were trying to be the protectors of the people. In principle, protectors protectors of people in reality what was happening in reality they were parasites if you have these keywords can you write a sentence out of it if you remember just the handful of keywords can you not write the second estate which comprised which had two subparts the noble of swords and in bracket landlords mon monarchs viscounts and then closing the bracket, the other one which uh, uh, or and and then you are writing the noble of robes, noble of robes and in noble of robes under back bracket, whom will you write down? Yes, they are not born, not by birth, they are by title, by title like for example, I gave you the example of judges, remember that, like for that example, I gave you the bureaucrats, the magistrates, right? So the bureaucrats, they are the people who originally belonged to the third state. They climbed up the ladder and became a part of the second state. Got it? S state, remember the word S state, don't end up writing state. Some students suffer from poor spellings, they don't pay attention to the spellings, please do so. Okay. Then you can also see that some of them are quite liberal because they are belonging to the third estate, no originally. So some of them are quite liberal in their outlook. Okay, because they rose from the third estate. So, because they rode from, rose from the third estate, they had compassion, they had empathy. Okay, and the rest of the people were belonging to the third estate, right? Third estate. No one should feel overwhelmed. Oh my God, so much has to be memorized. Don't get overwhelmed. This is like so easy an information. You know, the pressure of memorizing is when you don't understand a topic. For example, when I was in standard 10th, I could not understand chemistry. When I could not understand chemistry, I could not perform well in chemistry. I'm being very honest. I was exceptionally brilliant in subjects of literature and social sciences and biology and geography. But I was exceptionally pathetic in chemistry. Just because of one reason, I could not understand it. Okay. In our times, we like had the applied chemistry for the prelims in civil services and I understood it because there was logic because I, I could understand what's what and what is leading to what. So, I was like wow, yaar, this subject was so interesting. Why I hated it so much in my standard 10. I mean, hated it to the extent that I used to see the book and I used to be like, okay, I will read it later. Let me read biology or physics or do some maths or do some social sciences. That's fine. So, when you don't understand something and you are like, oh, there is trouble in learning, it makes sense because you are not understanding. But when you are understanding something and you are unable to learn, that means you are not revising enough. Okay? What should be the method of revision? Yes, people? There should be five revisions. Okay? First revision should be today. Second revision should be 24 hours later tomorrow. Third revision should be after a week. But when we are talking about the fourth revision, it is after 15 days. Fifth revision should be after a month. But other revisions means we can say second, third, fourth, fifth. They are speedy revisions. You don't sleep over the content. You just see through, yeah, yeah, I remember this, this, this. Sometimes you are just holding your hand and you are trying to recall the keywords and done. But keep revising. If you don't revise, even if you know, you cannot produce it. One more thing. Towards the end of this month, I will hold a test. Yes, exactly, a basic test, just with basic five questions, okay? So, start preparing from now onwards itself. It's quite amazing, right? Second lecture and talking about tests, right? So, but then preparing you beforehand is much better. And this is the most scoring area, remember that. Paper in this entire sociology paper 1 and 2, chapter 1, 2, 3, which majority of the times teachers ignore to start off with, let me share this with you, okay? 
whenever we are talking about this these three chapters they are highly scoring getting 70% or 80% is very easy in chapter 2 and 3 getting 90% is also possible but generally they are very dry areas so people have a tendency to say that okay let me just do chapter 1 and straight away jump to other areas i'm like do chapter 1 and 2 at least and after that you can do some other topics other thinkers other approaches then when i speak about what research methods are which thinker has used which research method that makes sense then you enjoy the third chapter also so you'll realize i'll be taking chapter 1 chapter 2 then talking about various sociological theories and perspectives and then starting with the thinkers chapter 3 i'll be taking up little later when you are matured with the content okay but always remember chapter 1 2 and 3 are most scoring areas of your preparation you get maximum marks in sociology when students get 330 this year highest point 304 but you can see in the past students have got 330 337 okay 342 also but that fellow was not my student okay but you can find such marks who gets such marks people who in some answers they are getting 8 out of 10 isn't in some answers they might be getting 5.5 or 6 but in few other answers they might be getting 7 or 8 also right so which are the chapters because this is competition you are fighting it's not a university exam that you just have to pass you need to learn and identify the chapters where you can score the maximum so which are the chapters where you can score the maximum this chapter 1 2 three what it because they are very technical there is no scope of improvisation i mean what can i improvise about like let's say 17th century europe what can i add about 18th century europe what can i add something new about like let's say what was happening during industrial revolution or french revolution they are fixed right fixed facts fixed possibilities all you need is analysis right sociology emerging as a science the second chapter whereby the debate is whether sociology should be treated like a natural science and studied like natural science with methods and techniques of natural science or sociology should be studied like a social science with certain methods and techniques of social science when the debate emerges natural science versus social science which approach is better and why you just have to write the reasons the methods getting it all of you okay there's one more freedom which i give to all my students whether we can uh, speak of uh, like let's say students who are present right now and whether you're like attending it live uh, through like satellite or online or you're offline you can always keep something to eat to munch i don't mind if a person is like munching a chewing gum or having a candy or like you know maybe if hungry the person is having an apple or something like that i don't don't mind what i really mind is if you start feeling tired lazy or you lie down and you start attending the lecture when you are online or or in satellite mode okay what really matters is your level of focus that is something which really impacts me i'm like ah why is the child not paying attention okay so just try to boost your energy level maybe you can have some uh, glucose or anything which is boosting your energy but be present be active okay just do not get distracted when you are doing this uh, specific lecture because i want all your concepts to be fixed all right so when we are moving ahead further with this specific dimension okay so no one has asked anything anything so third estate who are they third estate yes people quickly just a revision okay so they are the commoners they are the common people they are the peasants right okay so they are the commoners the peasants the artisans along with them who else who else sometimes merchants also very good merchants and traders so in the third estate also we can see there are two sub types two sub classes one is of the powerless right powerless okay this entire class whether of merchants or the traders or the peasants or the artisans all of them they were overloaded with work and taxes overloaded with work and taxes the only difference was merchants and traders when they earned a lot of money they used to purchase large tracts of land next to their brother's property who was the brother the feudal lord so purchase large tracts of land next to the property of the brother and then establish a factory and that is how the shift of power takes place 
and that's how they realize that the brother is having political power we don't have any political power because they are a part of second estate we are not so that's how they gradually start sponsoring and funding the revolt sponsoring first the ideology and later sponsoring the revolution remember that in the group few of you have uh, like uh, today in the morning while coming to the class i saw that some people have connected it with uh, like post modernism i'm like why and globalization contemporary scenario i'll provide an answer to it by like sending an audio message but don't stretch it too far that was not needed at least from sociological perspective for general query yes we can talk about it okay but not required for the answer so all of you can just like understand who are the third estate people right everyone can understand that yeah okay with respect to middle class and bourgeois when we speak of them then we can see that uh, now middle class and bourgeois at this time period is also a part of the third estate why because you can see merchants traders so not just that middle class and bourgeois bourgeois the middle class which is also a part of the bourgeois so on one hand so that's why someone asked that ma'am probably it was bhanu who asked that ma'am how did they grow in political power so the middle class or the bourgeois when we are saying that they are also a part of the third estate means they are not enjoying too much of power okay so they are rich they are secure but they don't have political power right so what will happen they will protest they will negotiate for power right so they are rich and they are secure we can also see the background let me say the background that is like uh, there is price rise in europe so price rise when i speak of it 1720 to 1789 okay we can see there is a 65% price rise 65% price rise okay we can see that this middle class which is comprising of as i told you earlier merchants bankers lawyers manufacturers they experience a lot of challenge they are like why are we suffering and why are we bearing all the taxes okay so they are rich they are secure but they enjoy no social prestige enjoy no social prestige no social prestige as compared to the first or second estate right so they are not enjoying any social prestige as the first and the second estate they don't have any power or influence okay so we can see that no power or influence no power or influence in the court or even like you know the way uh, it comes to like uh, uh, taking decisions and the first and the second estate they pay little attention to them they pay little attention they look down upon them they look down upon them niche nazar se dekh rahe so they are like what's wrong with us we are well off look down upon them so that's why now you can connect the missing dots when i said yesterday that the merchants and the traders they sponsored the capitalists they sponsored the revolt they sponsored the political revolutions remember that now can you see why yesterday i gave you the narrative the story today you are getting the details is everyone understanding why is that getting clear okay so when we are speaking of it when we are speaking of all these people then we can see that uh, the third estate and especially when we speak of the third estate in terms of the peasants the peasants please understand that it comprises of 80% of population 80% of population but it is owning only 30% of land only 30% of land so 80% of population 30% of land so is there inequality in terms of uh, inequality in terms of ownership of resources can we consider that inequality in ownership of resources yeah so they are burdened with taxes also in that situation what will happen the tendency to revolt will occur 
right all of you can connect it right okay so that is something which all of you can understand again when we speak of all of it you can now if i speak of the political aspect of france what was simmering in france do you remember yesterday what all i had discussed yeah do you remember politically what was happening in france giving you a brief again an academic outlook so political aspect of french society now when you are understanding the first second and third estate so when i'll be discussing about the political aspect of the french society that will make more sense first and foremost there is absolute monarchy so how this french revolution will articulate you will be able to understand is absolute monarchy so there is divine rights theory another keyword you should mention in your answer divine rights theory then what should happen then you all can see that there is 200 years of like rule of the bourbon dynasty the bourbon dynasty the same whereby you see louis 14 15 16 okay so bourbon dynasty is ruling ordinary people they don't have any personal rights commoners no personal rights no personal rights you can see the king's fine the king had the final word final word okay so when we speak of the law of this land so law was arbitrary and when laws are are arbitrary you don't have clarity that under what situation what punishment can be given so when laws become arbitrary what happens it leads to confusion so no one will be clear when one can be punished what can happen next okay the income of the estate when we speak of it so income whatever income the state is earning becomes the income of the king that's why he gets into lavishness and wasting of money income of king right if we speak of the economic aspect i yesterday discussed if i speak of the economic background yesterday i spoke of these kings with all of you and i said that the louis 14th louis 14th onwards we can see that uh, france indulged in expensive wars expensive wars i said that louis 14 this fellow he dies in 1715 and as louis 14 he dies in 17 uh, 15 france goes bankrupt it declares itself as bankrupt so this background if you get a question on french revolution you should know the background then louis 15 he kept borrowing and as i told you that as he kept borrowing okay and after him he knew that deluge is coming and louis 16 this fellow he is uh, like uh, quite weak his wife is marie antonet as i shared with all of you because the moment i asked you your faces like went blank as like do you remember yesterday's discussion on france and you're like ha huh, what so i was like let me give you the key words at least okay so she had expensive habit habits this lady and she was the person who said that if you don't have uh, enough money to eat bread they, then eat cake so that was there again you can see there is the intellectual revolution that takes place in this place okay okay the, you know you will realize this thing in the previous session that is in the previous batches whenever i have taken the lecture i explained this verbally i did not draw the draw the flow chart for this you are getting the flow chart for this information for the simple reason i try to keep every batch distinct so that even if someone is from the previous batch gets in um, like get some time and listens to the lecture realizes that oh this is far more detailed or this is something different from what my batch heard so that in every batch some extra effort something distinct something new is constantly created so this thing was something which i only verbally discussed in the previous batch then i realized that sometimes students tend to forget it so i thought this time i'll just give keywords so in terms of intellectual development it is called the age of reason and also the age of nationalism when we speak of age of reason and nationalism so we can just connect who the nationalists are so you can think of montesquieu 
these thinkers whom you will be studying in GS paper 4, John Locke, okay, Voltaire. In GS paper 4, ethics, you will be having these thinkers. So, there you will be getting exposed to their ideas. Rousseau, Montesquieu, Voltaire, John Locke, these are the nationalists. Montesquieu is the person who gave the spirit of law. I have notes in my notes. Okay. So, spirit of law. So, when he was discussing about the idea of power and authority and he discussed about the idea of individual liberty. Okay. When we speak of John Locke, he is an Englishman and he is speaking about individual rights. He is talking about how the rights of uh, individuals extend to right to life, right to property. Okay. And he is also discussing about the personal freedom that an individual ought to enjoy. Then we have Voltaire. Voltaire is talking about the concept of secularism in the, in the language of religious tolerance. Voltaire distinctly discusses about like uh, the concept of religious tolerance primarily. He is also talking about freedom of speech. He is talking about modern education, the nature of education and how education should be free from religious influence. He also speaks of individual rights, Voltaire. When we speak of Rousseau, Rousseau, uh, his work is called the social contract. Okay? And in social contracts, Rousseau is actually talking about the right to choose one's sovereign. And here comes the idea of democracy. When someone is choosing one's sovereign, the idea of uh, democracy ultimately comes into existence. So the governance should be based on individual choice. And that was a very big development by the time Rousseau, uh, like you know, um, like unfolds his insight. Please remember, you will not get questions exclusively on Montes, Locke, Voltaire or Rousseau. Just remember their names and briefly, if it goes in more detail, one sentence of who contributed what, that is it. If you come across any notes of any senior professor okay, in the market related to the same chapter, whereby the person has given one page on Montesquieu, one page on Locke, one page on Rousseau, ask yourself, that does the question paper support this information? Do I need to prepare it because are we getting questions on Locke and Rousseau, Montesquieu and Voltaire? No. So if the question paper is not supporting such a kind of questions, I will end up indulging in a lot of unnecessary details. If we see the questions, how did the French Revolution and Industrial Revolution play a role in the emergence of sociology? Write a short note on the emergence of sociology as an outcome of modernity and social change. Okay. Like this is the nature of question that you all will be finding. See this. Intellectual background and emergence of sociology. 150 words. You can see that. Right. So, you do not need to get into exclusive details. So, if anyone is thinking that, oh ma'am, if she would have written at least two, two sentences about each, yes, that would sound very good. But you won't have that intellectual space to write so much. Okay. There is much more that needs to be worked out. Okay? So, uh, that is something which all of you need to understand. Yes, Hobbes had given the social contract and along with that equality of men. So, very true Ankit. Okay? Uh, Rousseau further substantiated it. We cannot deny that fact. Okay? So, when we are uh, speaking about that very dimension and when we are like elaborating upon it, so you can just understand that these intellectuals, what are they creating? So, these intellectuals, they are like, you know, they are uh, uh, like we can say they are uh, giving new perspectives to the French people. Okay. So, we can uh, talk about new perspectives and imagination, imagination for a better society, new perspectives and imagination um, for the French society. French society. That is what articulates itself. And then further, we can see that uh, some of the French army, you remember yesterday I was discussing about it, that the French army, it went to America, right? And when it went to America, North America, that is, okay? And uh, in the Boston Tea Party, it participated in the overthrowing of the British. So, Boston Tea Party, you can connect with that as well. And in that, what happened? that it came to know that even traders and merchants can rule. Now, those traders and merchants which are powerless in France, 
part of third estate, not even given enough respect. No one is bothering about their view. Suddenly they realize that our power and rule can exist. There is a country where we went, our soldiers went to support. Who are the soldiers? Part of the third estate. So they are now coming up with a fresh idea that okay, that is a there is a possibility of uh, in this you can just write on American War of Independence. I'll give you a brief note on American War of Independence in the group itself. Okay, because that will get too much of details. So there you can note down. Okay, so in American War of Independence, we realize that the French army it like gained a lot of insights that how governance is possible even without monarchy. Okay, that insight was like uh, created. So it deeply affected, deeply affected them and ideas of liberty and equality were sowed. Okay, so ideas of liberty and equality, it, it became more pronounced for these individuals and they realized that we should work towards this specific dimension. Then there were certain events during the French Revolution which further triggered this possibility. If we speak of the events that happened during the French Revolution, here you will be borrowing a lot of insights from history. In history, during the French Revolution, you will come across the possibilities. First and foremost, you will come across this that the Estates General, he was requested, like you know, to call for a parliamentary body and incorporate the, like you know, the merchants and the traders, so all that, okay. But like you see that he is, he is like, uh, he actually was supposed to create that, but he did not call for the meeting. Truth is, the estates general, if I speak of their last meeting, it was almost a century back. So the last meeting was in 1614. So it's more like you can see that they are just enjoying all the privilege, but they are not even calling for a meeting. And like uh, creating a possibility of regular, we can say, um, discussion and, and space for listening to people's opinion. So definitely that will lead to a dissent. Okay. Louis XVI, you remember that he imposed a lot of taxes. In 1778, uh, when he was imposing a lot of taxes on the people of France, not on the first and second estate, primarily on the third estate, people will get agitated. May 5, 1781, if I speak of it. No, 81 will be too early. Let me move to 89 only. So, 1789, we see that this estates general, he was like, you know, um, called for a meeting. And then after this, imagine 1789, this comes for a meeting. A meeting was held. Imagine after 1614, in 1789, this, uh, like a meeting is called. And after this, what happens is that we see that... Uh, all these uh, individuals, they are when they are meeting in the National Assembly, at that time period, they realize that the third estate is again not called for and respected. Then the event of the tennis court happened and uh, the oath of the tennis court when, like, you know, a lot of the, we, it is considered that the seed of rebellion started from the oath of the tennis court. Why? Because in the oath of the tennis court, for the first time, the third estate proposed a new constitution that let us have a new constitution and rest is history because the moment you talk of a new constitution and a separation of the from the previous order it is then that a lot of history articulates itself right like for example uh, you know, if we speak of the idea of india and pakistan as two separate nations the moment the proposal of a separate country is sowed that like is the beginning of unfolding of a new era, new politics and rest becomes history, isn't it? The idea of Pakistan, the moment it was proposed. So the moment the proposal of two nation theory is made, rest of the politics will follow the proposal. Some will re resist it, some will support it. But later on the changes that will articulate, you will always remember from where and when the idea started. So that is the oath of tennis court. After this meeting with the estates general, that is what articulated. Anyway, so don't get into too much of detail. Because now I'm realizing that with so much of detail, if I further elaborate, it will get into the domain of history. So that's not required. 
with these basic facts you can understand so you can just briefly conclude that therefore when we speak of french revolution when the oath of tennis court when the oath of tennis court when the new constitution is proposed so new constitution is proposed to we can see to the changes which later on led to the movement of napoleon to like we can see that overthrowing the directorate the directorate by napoleon overthrowing of the directorate by the by napoleon is yet another mark that how the society slowly and steadily it started moving from feudalism and uh, from the possibilities which were uh, the political possibilities which were associated with feudalism to a new ushering a new era which was based on modernity and which was based on democracy okay so from here you can just connect with this specific idea okay then when we speak of this so you are understanding intellectual revolution how intellectual revolution is laced with french revolution how it is motivating people even for political thought independent thought the tendency to question okay then comes the industrial revolution industrial revolution last but not the least when we speak of the industrial revolution first and foremost we speak of when it is considered to begin so it is considered to begin in 1760 ad in england okay with respect to this french capitalist had given the political call of liberty for the capitalist as well as the serfs who were trapped in feudal lords yes that is something which i had discussed an hour back when i was discussing about the idea and yesterday also i discussed the same thing towards the end yesterday it was more generalized today it was more formal ankit did you join the session towards the beginning um, or or are you just reasserting the same fact i appreciate the thought though okay for giving it more formal language okay so industrial revolution when we are speaking of it then 1760 ad in england we all can see that it began along with this you can also see that uh, there were new territories new territories okay so new territories were found trade expanded to new areas with expansion of trade the demand will increase with the expansion of demand large scale production will happen large scale production we all can see this large scale production will unfold right with large scale production what will happen you will need new tools methods and techniques so new tools methods techniques all this will be needed when new tools methods and techniques will be needed then in this situation what will happen we all will be able to see that factory system of production factory system of production unfolds right and when we are talking about the factory system of production um 1760 to like let us say 1830 so these 70 years of like unfolding of the factory led production okay and then the factory system based production when it unfolds then what happens society moves from feudal to capitalist feudal to capitalist tell me something if you remember just this much can you articulate it into one para can you write this information in just two to three sentences can you do that is that possible languaging right okay so that's something which all of you need to learn how to convert the information which you are reading in like let's say uh, you know, this ridza or if you are reading the information in ignu if you want i can share the copy of ignu also related to the same chapter ignu is little more detailed that's why i did not share it yesterday but if you want i can share the copy of ignu we just want to run through like some key points some headings okay and along with the headings and key points if you want to like uh, maybe industrial revolution maybe let me read one para and get an idea what is written also in ignu if you want to do that you can do that okay right 
um also in the like yesterday before i had started the lecture i had posted the questions which were asked in 2020 and 2021 because this question paper soft copy that i had shared with all of you it is having questions till 2019 so 2020 and 2021 i have already shared so that related to this chapter how far like we are going to deal with that is industrial revolution french revolution and and this period of enlightenment scope of sociology common sense and comparison of sociology with other subjects all those possibilities which have been asked in last two years i have just given those questions in the group if you scroll it up you can find it out that's why any casual discussion that we are doing oh this material is not opening this pdf is opening okay yes thank you i removed everything so that we have less things to scroll up and down we just read only concrete information so no one should take it personally ma'am deleted i am deleting my comments as well because that unnecessary garbage does not need to exist let's focus only on the core dimensions in the group so that it's easy for us to find out information okay so when we are discussing about this possibility associated with this uh, unfolding of industrial revolution the when the society becomes industrial from feudal it becomes capitalist then there will be certain specific changes first and foremost as it becomes capitalist urbanization will occur with urbanization and growth in population so urbanization will happen population growth will occur okay population will grow with growth in urbanization and like you know population we'll also see unhygienic living conditions that i was highlighting to all of you this question was asked in gs paper 1 the question was in gs paper 1 history this question was asked probably 3 years back that how can we witness the problems associated with 18th century europe in present day india so first you have to recall the problems of industrialization experienced by people in industrial society of europe and then connect it with the problems of urbanization which people are experiencing today in india so comparing the problems like slums ghettoization exploitative working conditions uh, child labor all that stuff you have to recall like spreading of diseases increase in crime pollution all that had to be connected getting it so what you are studying over here if you find oh it is having a logical corollary with history always remember the information can be helpful in writing answers there as well okay so the conditions as i told you that the conditions were quite quite uh, unhygienic conditions right then you can also think about the condition of the labor okay so condition of labor class so condition of labor class when we speak of it then when we are talking about the condition of labor class we can also discuss along with this we can uh, further substantiate uh, the possibility of okay what was the condition of labor class quick keywords yes okay there was exploitation and one more keyword work was too mechanical hence alienation right so mechanized work which led to alienation something which you should be able to produce that's why i told you knowing things and capability to write it can be two different things so please tend to connect uh, the possibilities properly okay so because of this what will happen there will be different views that will come into existence marxist view will be highlighting the problem marxist view will be talking about this alienation talking about this exploitation and how to free the labor from the problem right whereas when we are talking about the conservatives conservatives will benefit from the problems benefit from the system so they will never feel like overthrowing the system so what will be the conservatives when they acknowledge the problem they like yeah yeah the problem is there let us try to find solution within the system so they will talk about labor reforms they will talk about new labor laws so the difference between a conservative and a radical is this radical believes in overthrowing the system bringing about like wholesome change wholesome transformation and a conservative will be talking about maintaining the order with few amendments with few we can say uh, changes right remember extremists and moderates in indian freedom struggle extremists were radicals 
moderates were trying to bring about some uh, like modification though they cannot be truly compared because after all moderates also were thinking about swaraj okay so they were talking about change and they were they were also victims of uh, like uh, the exploitation of the british though the response mechanism was different whereas conservatives many a times are part of the system and they don't want the system to change per se so do you like will you remember if i just write down radicals and conservatives can you connect with that just two keywords yeah help me recall what would the radicals want overthrowing of the system changing the system what will the conservatives want okay they will talk about reforms and change but with continuation of the system always remember that conservatives will talk about continuation of the system with mild reforms and changes okay whereas radicals will talk about overthrowing the system so they will be like initiating social change through the labor class okay so all that stuff will happen so what is what are the significant themes of this industrial revolution significant themes of industrial revolution when we speak of it so what are the significant themes people when we speak of it so first and foremost under the component of the significant themes of industrial revolution first and foremost we can reflect upon the condition of labor then transformation of property and all okay so condition of labor that's the first human thing that we need to work about okay so condition of labor yes what will you talk about it first and foremost will you talk about poverty and squalor that they were living in squalor is daridrata extreme um, excruciating um, exploitative condition that will lead to squalor in hindi it's referred as daridrata anyone who understands hindi those who don't no problem squalor is extreme poverty abject poverty okay uh, you can speak of again this socially deprived along with this social deprivation you can also talk about indispensable at the same time they are indispensable just a second let me write it properly so indispensable at the same time why indispensable because they are powerful social force they are good in number no so they can unite and they can create a re a rebellion a revolt so they are a powerful social force so on one hand they are socially deprived at the same time they are indispensable why because they are a powerful social force so sociology just sociologists they commented because sociologists will be commenting on the social problems so they said that the labor the living conditions of the labor the poverty of the labor poverty of the labor is not natural it is man made remember i said that towards the 19th century so towards the beginning of 20th century on absolute poverty also this statement was made so poverty of the labor is not natural remember these sentences they should flow out of you naturally even in essay you can use but social this is the impact of reading society or sociology when you start analyzing the core of the problems okay therefore when we speak of the working class okay in the 19th century they are subject to moral and analytical concern and that's why sociology comes into existence so they are subject subject means they are exposed to subject to moral and analytical concerns all right so then we can also see there will be another dimension other than the condition of labor will there be transfer the transformation of in, in the sense of property yes now i'm just going to write the keywords transformation of property will transformation of property take place yes transformation of property will it take place yes how from land industry right from owning of land you are owning factories and industries so urbanism is occurring industrialization is occurring new elites are getting created 
capitalists can like multiply profit they can hold profit right old cities will crumble new cities will come into existence so the transformation of property this component will occur you can connect it with urbanization you can connect it with rise of new elites you can talk of the capitalists okay you can keep connecting connecting with that specific idea the idea of property also will get an expansion it will become more materialistic in nature okay not only related to basic needs but also luxury goods that will be also like uh, getting added so that's something which all of you can connect with then what can be connected with this technology and how technology is aiding the factory system technology and factory system due to technology and factory system what will happen there will be shift in the forces of production because earlier who was producing animals human labor now the force of production the fop will shift right so there will be a shift in the fop forces of production machines are producing right along with that what else will happen there will be large scale migration that will take place right so large scale migration is something that uh, we can think of right then other than that what else can we further work on other than this yes yes with respect to technology and factory system will the production belong to the labor when the labor was cultivating in the field and growing the like let's say grains the labor controlled it he had to give a share of it to the feudal lord but here is the labor controlling the product that he she is producing no so there is zero control over the product that is also happening so a lot of changes constantly happen because of this specific possibility okay so one uh, problem is that the legal rational authority has replaced the traditional authority but the legal authority was more bureaucratic which is highly rigid and more centralized yes yes that's something and because of which you can see that systematic avenues of corruption shall open up that also does happen okay anyway so we all can see that with respect to the, the component of this technology and factory based system there will be change in the nature of production the human relations the relation with the product how people are connecting with the product how people are controlling the wholesome possibility of we can say uh, taking charge over the different resources like the urban resources like the different types of bodies which are controlling the people in the urban area everything will undergo a quantum shift all of you can connect with this now this is the last opportunity for you to run through this material related to this emergence of sociology it is very simplistic now you will find that this is a cake walk compared to what i have discussed it is very simplistic so it's i have discussed about like you know the three uh, dimensions i have discussed briefly about the period of enlightenment you can see there is locke voltaire rousseau montesquieu i was discussing about all of them M montesquieu what he wrote john locke okay so you can see all these individuals voltaire and that's why i did not give you any dictation because um, that was not needed only keywords which is required for you how to prepare the notes then i have given something related to french revolution after the french revolution i have given you a basic insight about industrial revolution anything which was mentioned over here i refrained to incorporate it in your flow chart the flow chart is having distinct points which are not there in this material okay so please go through this material this time because those who have completed the homework okay they should be rewarded and they should be given something extra to read the rest of you will get more to read so what is the more thing so tomorrow i am starting with scope of sociology and after finishing with scope of sociology rather than indulging in comparison of sociology with other social sciences this will be again homework for tomorrow not today tomorrow so today's homework other than reading emergence of sociology read scope of sociology and after reading scope of sociology go towards the end of the material towards the end of the material you will find this sociology and common sense so sociology scope of sociology and sociology and common sense is what we will discuss tomorrow okay comparison of sociology with other subjects that's a basic material you'll read you'll understand i'll help you to understand that 
by making a comparative analysis chart in the class and how to read the material. I won't, I won't be indulging in the details of every single subject. Okay, I'll brief up two or three and how to read it, how to memorize it, how to prepare notes, and I'll straight away switch to next chapter, that is chapter two. Okay, that will happen after, like in the next week. Tomorrow we'll be just focusing on scope and common sense. Okay, scope of sociology and common sense. So let's meet tomorrow. Thank you all of you for your uh, patience. And uh, Subhash, uh, Su, uh, Sushri Das, your question will be taken up tomorrow. All right. Thank you.